Good evening. As Fiona mentioned, my name is Michael Swack. And uh, Fiona, I'm also a faculty member at the Paul College. Yes, you <laughs> often forget. Well, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Gary tonight. Fiona already warned me by starting uh, and telling me, uh, uh, you really can't start your story or your introduction with remember the time when. So I'm going to cut out all the remember the times when. We'll maybe get to that when you do your storytelling, Gary. But it's a pleasure to have Gary here because in many ways he, he's the classic entrepreneur, but also the classic and someone who's always giving back. Uh, Gary, as most of you know, is the co-founder and chairman of the organic yogurt leader, Stonyfield Farm Yogurt. Uh, but he's also an author. He's written a couple books, including Stirring It Up, How to Make Money and Save the World, and co-author of Label It Now, uh, What You Need to Know About Genetically Engineered Foods, uh, an area where Gary is spending increasingly amount of, time, of his time these days to try and uh, address that particular issue. He's a frequent speaker on topics ranging from sustainability to social business to climate change to profitability of businesses. He serves uh, as a volunteer on, on many boards, both uh, nonprofits and, and, uh, and businesses. And uh, President Barack Obama also appointed Gary to the Advisory Committee for Trade and Policy Negotiations. And he's co-chair of a group called AGREE, a food and agricultural policy effort that was launched by eight of the country's largest uh, foundations. Uh, lastly, I'd say Gary's a good friend of UNH. Gary, uh, you've come and spoken here many times. You, you've done it gladly. We really appreciate your presence, and we're happy to have you tonight as well. So please help me welcome Gary Hirsch. So um, when I was invited uh, by Fiona and Michael and my friends here to come uh, talk with you all, and of course I was here and part of the very exciting program uh, last year, the kickoff program, I thought, um, you know, what would be most useful? What would be helpful? And I, um, Michael and I, and, and and working with the Karsty Institute, have run a uh, institute for years. It's I think we've probably done 20 of them um, for um, emerging entrepreneurs. It's essentially a boot camp for entrepreneurs. It's a couple of days. And it's all storytelling. It's not lecturing and so on. We're taking a little pause from that right now. But I, I, I reflected on that institute and the fact that really in the business of social enterprise, in the business of enterprise, um, we mostly learn from storytelling, right? First of all, we mostly learn from doing, not, there's no real theoretical, uh, there's no real way, real way to program these uh, unique creatures. Uh, but also, uh, for the most part, it's about, uh, uh, you know, ready, fire, aim. It's about trying stuff out. And, and these institutes uh, have been wonderful for just getting into learning that, for example, when you do launch one of these enterprises, there's really no way that you're, you know, you're never off the clock, right? I mean, there's, it's, it, any entrepreneur is essentially what I call a pathological optimist. It's, you know, it's just a 24-7 kind of thing. Um, but it's the kind of thing that uh, you, know, you, you find out very quickly from doing. So what I thought I would do is share kind of my top, this is David Letterman, my top eight lessons that I've sort of taken away from 20 years of doing these institutes, and obviously from my, my own experience. And, um, I just thought that these might be, for those of you who are thinking about going into business, thinking about launching, uh, who are in businesses right now, uh, for those of you who are wondering, you know, what the heck happened? You know, how'd you get into this mess? I think hopefully these are useful. And, and, and often what I tell people at the end of one of these little summations is, I, I, at the very least, I hope that you'll, if you're starting a business, you'll recognize that if we could do it, you can do it, okay? That, that actually... Um, if we got through all this stuff, then uh, maybe you'll feel better about your own predicament. Because I, I will tell you that it was, um, you know, nothing but predicaments from day one. You have to understand that sort of on day one, 1983, starting an organic yogurt company, um, when nobody was eating yogurt and nobody knew what organic was, was you know crazy, right? We, I often joke, but it's not such a joke. It's sort of true that in those days we had a wonderful company, just no supply and no demand. And, and, the, and the goal was really to sort of, you know, uh, educate people about why there was really something called yogurt that we should be eating and, 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 and why it was important that it be organic. Um, and I'm often reminded when I think about the early days and the kind of innocence of, um, 
uh, Winston Churchill had two wonderful lines that I love. He, one of them, he said, is uh, experience is something uh, you don't get until just after you need it. <laughs> and, and that was really true for us. We got a lot of experience, uh, but you know, it was always sort of looking back, gee, I wish we had or hadn't, you know, fill in the blanks. And that, of course, leads to the other uh, spectacular quote, which I think is a life quote, but it's certainly an entrepreneur's one, and that is that uh, success is the ability to move from failure to failure with no loss of enthusiasm. And, and you know, by that measure, we were very, very successful uh, in the early going. Uh, but you should understand, and especially those of you thinking about entering the competition or thinking about starting out, we were nine years before we made a nickel. Nine years before we made money, and that meant nine years of fundraising. And that, the joke was sort of on me because I, I had left the nonprofit world to, because I was tired of fundraising. And of course, that's all, you know, I just sort of switched the nonprofit for the for profit hat. Turned out that nonprofit fundraising skills were pretty useful uh, as I knocked on endless doors. Um, but let me uh, just tell you, you know, in hindsight, having gotten through that, um, you know, when you think about social enterprise, uh, remember it's about enterprise. And so my lessons will start with, you know, how do you even forge a business from this crazy ideas that you, these crazy ideas that, you know, in our case, organic yogurt, but in your case, and we'll have three wonderful cases tonight, uh, you know, whatever it is. And so I would say lesson number one is, is what I consider sort of gospel. Uh, and, and absolutely, particularly in, here in New Hampshire, particularly for those of us who would by definition be underfinanced relative to somebody else who's already established, uh, that your product or service has to be better in some way than anything that's out there. And I, I know that you could say, yeah, duh, why do it? But, but, but yet uh, that isn't so obvious to people a lot of the time. If it isn't better, if it's not superior, you're not going to win. You're not even going to get on the game board. And it's not a guarantee of success that you're, you have a, a, a unique, what we call a USP, a unique selling proposition. But, but it, it's a prerequisite to even getting in the game. And I don't think, I don't care if that, you know, if you're doing something retail, something service, a product. And in our case, we had that. We had this amazing yogurt. Uh, Samuel, my partner, was running um, an organic farming school. And we used to sit at his board meetings. I was one of his trustees, eating this delicious yogurt. And when Reagan, Ronald Reagan came in and slashed funding for uh, organic agriculture, renewable energy, basically everything that we were doing, one of us came up with this crazy idea of selling the yogurt that we were eating from his then one cow. Um, he also, by the way, he was a fermentation nut, still is. He also had beer and kimchi and sauerkraut. And you know, fortunately, we chose uh, the yogurt, as it turned out. Um, you should know, uh, I mean, this, this yogurt was uh, ambrosia. It, it just tasted so much better than was out there. Th those were the days when, um, well, actually, Newsweek had come out with an article showing that there was more sugar in a Dannon yogurt than in a Snickers bar. You know, this was America's attempt at yogurt, which is, of course, well-developed around the rest of the world. But in the US, we didn't know what it was. It was mostly sold at ski areas for those who were around back then. Um, but we got an early indication that this was a, a superior product by um, the Iranian hostage crisis had just happened. And it was all over the news. Ayatollah Khomeini was you know, on the front page of every paper saying, you know, down with America. We're going to take America down. And an Iranian uh, refugee had resettled in our local uh, next door to us in Milford, New Hampshire. And she drove up to the farm one day and she said, uh, you know, Mr. Hirschberg, Mr. Kamen, uh, I've got uh, a great marketing idea for you. Uh, you know, I know something about yogurt because they've been eating yogurt in Iran for, you know, ever. Uh, she said, um, uh, your yogurt is the best thing I've had in this country since I moved over not long ago from the old country. She said, I, I, I want to suggest that you call it a taste of Iran. Which, you know, at the time with Ayatollah Khomeini on the front page, we chose to ignore that piece of marketing wisdom. But it was validation that we were on the right track. And that superiority from that moment, that lesson from the beginning right on through time and again and again has been the thing that has, has made it all possible. It enabled us. First of all, it won us investors. Certainly, it certainly won us customers. It got us on the shelf. Um, I was standing on the, in Florida uh, one time uh, looking at a competitor's yogurt. And I was reading an ingredient that I still can't pronounce. It was actually in a Yoplait. I can say it now. And um, a little old lady came up to me and tugged me in the elbow and said, a young man, somebody your age really should be eating the Stonyfield instead of that stuff. 
which was, you know, like a religious experience for me, right? <laughs> to have someone telling me that. And I asked her why, and she started talking about the yogurt and how good it was and that we give 10% of our profits to environmental causes, that it was the social mission that the company measured its carbon footprint. And I said, you know, how do you know all this stuff? And she told me this very sad story that her um, husband had just died of uh, uh, colon cancer about six months earlier. And she and the girls, uh, this is her bridge club, um, you know, they would sit around playing bridge and they would talk about products because they, they wanted to be, stick around, to be around for the, her. In her case, she was talking to me about her granddaughter's high school graduation. She didn't want to succumb to cancer as her husband had. And so they were sharing ideas. And one of the things they're saying is you should be eating organic and you should be eating this great yogurt. And so they had created the word of mouth. This is way before what we now call social media, right? This, this was social media, playing bridge and, you know, telling stories. Um, so, you know, Samuel was a maniac for detail. He was absolutely incredible. I can now, I think the statute of limitations has passed, so I can now tell you. We had a filler, uh, an auto, by, by law, you weren't supposed to put the caps on the yogurt cups uh, by hand. It was supposed to be mechanized, but we couldn't afford the real thing. So we bought a used one that was broken. It would sat there, and when the inspector would come, we'd say, you cannot believe it. You guys always pick the day when it's broken. Of course, it was always broken. Um, and we used to take the cups, and Samuel would look in the cups to see if there was dust. Then we'd fill it, and then put the cap on the top. I mean, that was the kind of attention to detail. And, and uh, you know, maybe not attention to quality, but it was certainly attention to sanitation. Um, so the point is, though, without a superior product, no social mission, no dream, no nothing. And I just can't stress that enough. Um, the second uh, lesson for me in reflection, and I've seen this again with countless entrepreneurs, is what I call: if you don't ask, uh, if, if you don't ask, you don't get. And you're going to have Sally Sampson up here in a few minutes, who will be a living case. Uh, you know, she has willed this business into existence, and 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 that that, by the way, is true of almost you know any entrepreneur I know. Uh, in our case, um, you know, it was. Never taking no for an answer is not just a set of words. It's, it's the real thing. I'll just give you a couple of examples. In 1984, I'd been trying to get our yogurt into then Bread and Circus, now Whole Foods. Um, they had three stores in Boston. I'd been trying to get it in there for about a year. And they already had five you know, organic yogurts made by some hippie in New Hampshire or Vermont. And they didn't need a sixth one. And they were you know, really not interested. So I had my old uh, Ultimate Frisbee team from college up at the farm for my 30th birthday in 1984. And after blowing out the candles, I said, listen, it's all, and most of them lived in Cambridge. Uh, uh, of course, Frisbee players, right? So um, in those days. Uh, and so I, uh, I said, listen, it's wonderful you guys have all come, but if you want to give me a really great present, please go down to Bread and Circus and ask for our yogurt. That was a Sunday. And on Wednesday, the buyer from Bread and Circus called me. This is a true story. And said, Gary, I don't know what's going on, but demand has gone through the, <laughs> through the roof. Get the product in here right away. And we, we did. We drove it that night down to, because this was our moment. And, and then, you know, we started demoing and sampling. But it was just always asking, always, you know, uh, bludgeoning our way in. Um, I had a situation, which I'll tell you about in a couple moments, where we had really a truly a near-death experience where in the fall of 1987, we had a, a, a bad collapse. Um, and we were on, on vapors. We were on fumes. And uh, one of the first things I had to do was get my milk and fruit and cup suppliers to keep me in stock, even though I couldn't pay them anything. And so I called my fruit supplier in Ohio. And I said, uh, you know, I've got some good news and bad news. Can I fly out and meet you in person? And at, I, we had no money, so I borrowed a credit card um, and flew out and met with him. I said, listen, here's the bad news. Uh, we owe you $95,000 and we have no cash. And in fact, we don't have any likelihood of having any cash to pay you within six months. I said, but the good news is if we can keep getting your fruit at our rate of growth, you know, we will not only be in six months able to pay you back, but we will be buying twice the fruit and so on. It was, you know, pretty, a lot of chutzpah, right? Um, and I, I said, this is the deal that we'd like to offer you. We'd like to ask you to keep supplying us with fruit. And we're going to use, it's almost hard for me to say this with a straight face, we're going to use about $250,000 worth of fruit um, in the next uh, six months. And we'd like you to advance it. Um, we will then turn that into a loan 
uh, which we will repay you over the following two years at your interest rate. This was a joke because nobody would lend me anything. So just the fact that you know, I would ask them for, to do it at, at, at a rate uh, was crazy. I said, and we will secure it with our stock, which was also a joke because the stock was actually a liability, not an asset. Um, and they said yes. And you know, the punchline, I mean, they, they, went in, you know, they went into their room and talked about it for a while. And they said, look, uh, you know, this guy has got a lot of chutzpah. You know, he he's, he's obviously believes in himself. Their growth trends have been good. The yogurt is delicious. I brought them yogurts. And, um, and you know, uh, now, uh, gosh, I haven't even done the math recently, but four or five years ago when I uh, last told this story at an institute, uh, at that time, we had bought about $170 million worth of fruit from these guys in the time that had elapsed. So it was a great bet for them, but they obviously had to take the risk. But that risk wouldn't have even been possible if I hadn't asked. So you have to ask. So you can't be afraid. You've got to stand up for yourself. Um, you know, when we first moved into our building, uh, when we outgrew the farm, moved into our building over in Londonderry, uh, we were in uh, 21,000 feet of a 165,000-foot building. We Ask can we to, in order for us to move in take seven of your however many it was units uh, we would like to have the right to buy the building uh, we would like to have the right to buy the land because they own lots around it it was crazy I mean we were again on fumes begging for a lease uh, the only reason we went to this building by the way uh, was well there were two reasons one Londonderry offered uh, a lot of waste treatment uh, uh, infrastructure but the main thing was that they wouldn't they didn't require a personal guarantee. Because I was afraid if they looked at our personal financials, I, I would have never gotten in there. And because there were, you know, again, all red ink in our personal, I mean, our, our net worth was way, way, way in the hole. We were borrowed up to the, the hilt. Um, and again, they said yes. And by the way, to this day now, we own not only the building, but we own 30 acres around it. And we needed that acreage. There came, a, uh, there's many, many companies I know uh, who don't envision success and they outgrow the space that they're in. And, they, and we would have had to move. And it's, if you've ever seen a dairy plant, it's kind of hard to move all that stainless steel. So again, it was a don't ask, don't get. When I did the deal with Danone uh, in 2001, where we sold them initially 40% of the company, and then uh, over time they could buy another 40 to own the majority, I demanded that in order to be our investment partner, um, they could uh, buy these shares, but they had to leave me in control. They had to uh, give us majority control. That's chutzpah, right? That's, you know, they were going to own 80% of the company, and I, I wanted to be in control. Um, and they said yes. And the reason they said yes is they were completely mystified by this organic company whose gross margins were 10 points worse than theirs, but our net margins were the same as theirs because we had learned to sell and grow a business uh, without depending on advertising, like most consumer products companies. So they were blown away by that. Um, but... There are consolidation rules. Any of the finance folks in the audience will know. When you buy and you, uh, uh, and you wholly own a company, or 80%, and you consolidate the results, you have to demonstrate control, not just by owning stock, but, but you, you actually control the decision making. In other words, you control the board. And so I didn't know that when I was asking you know, to have, remain in control. They're the ones who came up with a solution. And their solution was that they would vote, that I would get to vote two board seats, they would get to vote two three board seats, but one of the seats they voted would be me. It was this very simple solution, which gave us 60% control. But again, if I hadn't asked, I can tell you dozens of companies, because these organic companies are being gobbled up by large companies. I think it's generally a good thing if you can protect your standards, because this is how we change the world. This is how we get more organic out there. Um, but again, most companies don't ask, and you've got to. You've got to defend your interests. And of course, the corollary of that is the third lesson, which is you've just got to believe in yourself. Uh, you know, those of you who are or will be raising capital need to understand that the process of capital raising is a um, very, very, very deeply humbling process. Uh, and it's made uh, more so by the fact that in, for, for the most part, with traditional, I call it vulture capital, uh, private equity, traditional, not you know, sort of enlightened, but um, their goal is to actually literally reduce your self-worth, your valuation, because they want to own a higher percentage for the dollars they're putting in. And so their job is to knock you down, is to challenge your business plan, is to challenge your precepts, is to say, you know, all this social mission stuff, you know, 
that's all great, but let's get serious about the business, when in fact the whole reason you're doing it is the social mission stuff. And we had endless of these. I mean, I had investors who, um, I had one who sat at his desk with his feet up on his desk, clipping his fingernails during my meeting, you know, and he offered me something called a convertible preferred, which was that he would lend us, he would invest money, he would get equity, he would get an actual percentage of ownership, but in two years, we would actually have to pay his money back. He would still have his ownership, and he would get an interest rate on it. It was this like bizarre thing, and he just sort of looked down the, his, you know, past his feet at me, you know, because his feet were up in the desk saying, you know, it's a very common kind of thing. Well, you know, you have to believe that that's the moment to get up and walk out, which is exactly what I did. And I can't tell you how many times I had to do that, even though I was desperate for the money, you know, desperate for the, the nickel. Um, the, the context for this, and this is important to uh, the remaining lessons, but also to the one I had just told you about the, 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 uh, the, the fruit deal, is that we had contracted a dairy. Uh, we had outgrown our little farm in Wilton, and we had contracted a dairy in western Massachusetts um, who had uh, a, a plant but not enough product. We had a great product, not enough plant. So we went out and contracted with him, but we were so desperate to be in there that we didn't do enough due diligence. We didn't really study his books. We had been in that plant for about six months, and we were actually within sight of starting to make money because we were being efficient. And you know, Samuel and I were able to now focus on sales and marketing and not manufacturing. Um, when the SBA called me on a Thursday night, this is, by the way, the weekend before the crash of 87. I realize many of you were not born then, but uh, there was a, a very dark, uh, a uh, weekend for in 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 American uh, you know in, in, on Wall Street, um, and it began on the 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 Black Friday that the next morning after this call, and the SBA officer called and said, Gary, would you like to buy this other dairy? Well, again, we had no money. You know, we had we were we were constantly in debt. We we're constantly begging and borrowing. I mean, I used to my 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 major investor was actually my mother-in-law. Not a good idea. Um, I would lie in bed at night uh, with Meg because our our um, bedroom was about 50 feet from the office, and I would think she would be asleep, and I would tiptoe out of you know uh, out of the bedroom over to my office to call my mother-in-law on a Wednesday night before Thursday payroll to see if I could borrow another three thousand dollars you know to meet payroll. And this happened more than a few times. M Meg was not asleep. She was calling on call waiting, saying, "Mom, don't do it." on the other line. So, you know, we were leveraged is, I guess, to put it, you know, properly. Um, and so I said to this banker, I said, no, you know, we can't buy, buy this thing. Why? And she said, well, because the SBA tomorrow morning is going to pull his loan because he has failed uh, to meet his covenants for the third consecutive year and we can't renew. And I said, well, how long do I have? And she said, well, you know, we're going to speak to him tomorrow, but we'll, we'll see. Well, it turns out they, they went in and put him right into chapter seven the next morning padlocks and all. My cups, lids, fruit, yogurt were in his plant. They let my employees out, um, but that was about it. And I had to come up with, in 24 hours, $100,000 to buy my stuff out. Um, borrowing, again, mom, you know, whoever. Uh, I used to say anybody with a tie was fair game. You know, I used to talk to anybody. The UPS guy didn't like to come on, on Thursdays because <laughs> for fear I'd hit him up for a loan, okay? Um, and um, we had to borrow 100000 to get the inventory out, and then we had to restart the little factory back in New Hampshire, which had already, we'd already doubled our volume, and that, that took another 150000 So we had to raise $250,000 and start the plant back up. And then we started producing seven days a week, three shifts a day, to keep, just to, just to tread water. And we were, of course, losing money because now we were grossly inefficient the other way. We were producing, you know, too much. We were, we were actually making drinkable yogurt at, uh, uh, when we weren't trying to make drinkable yogurt because we were having contamination problems. It was supposed to be nice and firm. But anyways, it was a lot of chaos. You get the picture. So we finally, in this sort of borrowing, begging, stealing, whatever we had to do, no, no stealing, I'm joking, uh, but getting money, we found, we struck a deal with a large dairy in northern Vermont. It wasn't Ben and Jerry's. I can say it now. It's, it's long since gone. It was Cabot Creamery under different ownership. And we, and they were going to take over our manufacturing again and allow us to focus on marketing and sales. And we had negotiated this deal. We actually financed a fax machine. You can't imagine this, but a fax machine in those days cost $3,500. First fax machines. It, actually, ours was the first fax machine in southern New Hampshire 
come truth be told. And we use that to negotiate with them. Um, we literally got a bank to you know, lend us against this device. And the banker came up to watch the fax the first time it came through. I mean, it was like this new thing. I know none of you students can appreciate this era, but you know, I, I was there. Um, anyhow, uh, they, um, we, we negotiated this deal, yay thick, you know, all the covenants and who was going to be in charge of what. I drove up to Vermont for the, for the big closing. My wife was pregnant. Uh, we were, she was literally about due to deliver our first child. We had borrowed. She had, her father had died in the interim. He had left her $30,000. I had used it to buy fruit. I mean, we were you know, way out there on the limb, right? No, past the limb, whatever that is. And she said to me, you, know, you promised this deal is going to be done, right? We're going to end this nightmare. Because we were working 24 hours a day. I said, absolutely, the deal's done. It's right here. We're going to go up and sign it. I got up there, make a long story short, there was a single piece of paper at my seat at the desk where I was, uh, uh, where the deal document was supposed to be to be signed. And it turned out there was a letter to me, and they had decided to retrade the deal. They thought that we were so desperate, which we were, that they could just steal the company. And they, what they offered to do was convert all of our shareholders' equity to debt, um, which was smart of them, because that would take out anybody who had the means to sue them out of the picture, because the shareholders would have to agree to uh, become lenders, that and we could pay off the shareholders at a rate of one penny per cup, uh, which they figured would take about two years. At the end of that, the shareholders would be paid off, and Samuel and I could then negotiate our future employment. It was a steal, not a deal. It was even worse than the guy clipping his fingernails. And I said a few things that I definitely can't say on the campus of a reputable university, uh, got up, left. Um, and Samuel and I started driving back. And of course, don't you know, it's April, but we're having a blizzard now in April. And, and we were, as it turned out, the only car on the road. It was, we're getting feet and feet of feet of snow. Uh, and we're driving along in the darkness. I'm trying to think, where do we go? Because I couldn't go home and face my pregnant wife. Um, I didn't know, worse than that, if we went back, one of us would have to make yogurt that night. Um, and I thought, you know, uh, Canada is not that far, you know, thinking all kinds of crazy thoughts. And, we, and, 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 and then we started just, you know, I, 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 I asked Samuel, what will you do now? And he said, uh, I think I'll do something in sales, you know, which was just horrifying. He was making this absolutely ambrosia, perfect, amazing yogurt. This was just money, right? That's all this was. We could solve this. And so I said, Samuel, what do you think it would cost us to build a little yogurt plant? And he said, you know, I was thinking the same thing. And we started designing a yogurt plant. These lunatics driving, you know, Route 31 through, you know, back roads, New Hampshire. <laughs> we got home about 2 a.m. My wife came out, you know, pregnant belly, and said, you know, is it done? Is it done? I said, no, 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 we're not doing that deal, but we have a much better idea now. <laughs> uh, I, slept, I slept alone that night, uh, and was in Concord the next morning at 7 a.m. at the SBA office when they opened. And uh, you've heard of Stone Soup. Some of you know the story of Stone Soup. Well, here it was. I went into the SBA. I said, listen, we have figured out that we can build a yogurt plant that can you know, be a proud New Hampshire uh, uh, a facility for $498,500. We had done the math that night. And we have a bank interested in loaning to us if we get the SBA involved. That was an exaggeration, we had no bank. I said, and we have investors willing to put up, because I knew we needed 20%, the $100,000 that we need. That was also not true, but I figured we could get that. And they talked, and they said, well, sure, if you've got the bank and you've got the investors, then you know, we'll, we'll do this deal. We'll do this deal. Got in the car, drove to Bank of New England, may it rest in peace, no longer exists, um, and said, well, the SBA is ready to sign on a deal, and I've got equity investors. Will you guys provide the loan? And, you know, one thing led to another, and they said, yeah, well, we can do this loan. <coughs> Convened a meeting with the shareholders the next night in Boston. Said, the SBA is on board, the bank's on board, uh, all we need is 100000 and, you know, they were facing that or lose everything. So you get the idea. You've got to believe in yourself, okay? Uh, I'm not saying, the lesson is not lie. Just, <laughs> you know, you can just, truth can be just kind of, you know, stretched a little. But you really have to trust your instincts and believe in yourself when no one else will when no one else will. Um, we, um, and, and this happened, I have a hundred of these examples. We had you know, cancerous senior managers who came in who just thought we were really naive. And uh, we had uh, investors who were uh, you know, giving us a bill of goods and so on. So 
This comes up in every occasion. Um, fourth, and by now I don't probably have to say this to you, but especially to those of you yet to start, know your cash requirements. Know how much cash you're going to need. And whatever you think you're going to need, double it. Okay, I'm looking at folks submitting business plans right now. I'm trying to catch your eye. Take this one seriously. Because you can run out of a lot of things, but you can't run out of cash. Um, and if you do, you know, it's, that's fatal. I, I wrote dozens of business plans. And I know you're being told by your wonderful professors here, write business plans, and they're right. But it's not because of the result. It's not because of the product. It's because of the process. The writing of the business plan, the asking of those questions, the testing, finding out about competition, the testing of your assumptions, the retesting, the challenging, the, the what ifing, all that stuff, that's critical. The business plan is probably obsolete when it's done. That, but, but the knowledge and the information is, is what you've gained from it. Um, get third-party validators to kick the daylights out of your um, out of your numbers. I had an accountant uh, who was, um, you know, uh, let's just say she had entirely different political persuasions than me. Fortunately, his wife was addicted to our yogurt. And, uh, but he was empathetic with this, you know, this, these guys who were learning as we went. And he, I would sit at his kitchen table and he would, you know, really kick the daylight. And this was before, you know, spreadsheets. We were we were, you know, this is almost abacus days, okay? I mean, I'm not quite that old. But, 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 but you know, we, we needed, th this was, you know, by definition, entrepreneurs underestimate our costs and overestimate our revenues. And you've got to do the exact opposite. Double the expected costs and have your expected revenues or delay them. And you, you must do that. And, uh, you know, the net result of not doing it is you are raising money all the time and putting yourself at the mercy of others um, and, and stretching you know, reality. We did stretch reality in a zillion ways. Uh, we had the famous uh, paycheck contest. Who, who could go the longest without cashing their paycheck? This was a, an employee contest. And you know, of course, what they won was yogurt, right? Um, we had the famous accounts payable uh, stretching uh, technique where we had a check uh, during this very dark period. Uh, I took a check for a, a large fruit supply um, uh, check out to the driveway, which was all dirt, stepped on it a couple times, got it nice and dirty, put it in my desk. You know, they called a week later and said, by the way, your check hasn't arrived. And I said, you would not believe it. it it fell out of the mailbag. We found it in the driveway. We'll send it today. And I, you know, tucked that in a clean envelope, but showed them the dirt. So it was, you know, again, I stretched things a little bit. But, but that's what you end up doing. Number five, um, over communicate. What is it, why is he saying that? Uh, well, over communicate with your vendors. Tell them the story. Tell them what you're doing. Tell them what's behind your mission. Tell them, you know, that you're about your successes. Uh, over communicate with your shareholders, your backers, your investors. Give them more information. Don't become the stranger who they're not hearing from. Um, one brilliant thing that we did, I didn't know it at the time, I, as you might have figured, I had a lot of shareholders. I had 297. One thing, by the end of it, one thing I did was every year I would send a note out in December. I would say, anybody who would like to exit to sell your stock, let me know and I will find someone to buy it. And I have to tell you, I spent probably 40% of my time each year finding buyers for selling shareholders. But, but they, 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 it built shareholder confidence. It made them feel like I had their interests. I wasn't just off doing my yogurt thing. I, was, you know, I understood that it was their money. Um, we had weekly calls with our vendors telling them what our needs were, but also what our financial situation was. We were very open book. Uh, it didn't help that one time... Um, one of my well-meaning employees sent a fruit sample um, off to uh, our fruit supplier. And we were, you know, crazy environmentalists, right? So we didn't waste anything. So they took, when we had open book meetings where we would share our P&L, so one of my employees took one of our P&Ls and, you know, crumpled it up and used it as packing paper for the, uh, for the little fruit in the jar. So my um, fruit supplier called me and said, so you had a $11,000 loss last week. And, you know... How'd you know that? Well, I'm reading it right here. So, but, you know, over-communicating, you know, helped us. And particularly when you are 
kind of mission driven and, you know, have this, uh, uh, you know, human element to your story. Um, you know, folks who are selling to you, folks who are banking for you, folks who are trucking for you, they, people want to hear good news. They want to hear support hopeful kinds of things. And, and that hope is a kind of a currency that you really can trade upon, at least to a point. Uh, number six, and this is going to seem, again, like one of those does, but I cannot stress this enough. You have to take care of yourself. And you have to take care of the people around you, too. Uh, Meg, um, you know, our survival was that we, whatever else was going on, we would take a walk, usually once a day, and we would take real vacations. We couldn't afford them. We would go to her mom's or whatever, but we took real time. And my wife's written an entire book about this, by the way, which you might want to read. It's called, uh, um, uh, 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 I'm, I had my book title in my head. Uh, sorry, no, no, no. It's called For Better or For Work, A Survival Guide for Entrepreneurs and Their Families. And, you know, putting down the smartphone, right? And the funny thing about her writing about me putting down this, that, that my not putting down the smartphone was a problem, was that when she started writing her book, she became a work maniac, and she never put it down. So it was very vindicating. It helped me in the long run. But I'm, but I'm serious that, you know, you are useless if you are not well or if you're, you're not happy. And there's obviously a lot of stress and, and, and loneliness in doing and embarking on this, you know, this path. Um, so you need to be selfish. It's okay to ask to take care of yourself. You're, you're useless to your cause. You're useless to your employees. You're useless to your business. For me, uh, exercise was absolutely key. At night, after the day of milking and making yogurt and fighting with creditors and borrowing money, um, Hampshire Hills, our local tennis club over in Milford, had free court time at 10 p.m., which free was a good word for me at this time. Uh, and I had another entrepreneur friend, and we would go over and play tennis and hit these whack, these little fuzzy yellow balls. And I would, I mean, my wife would be horrified that after a long day, I would go over to play tennis instead of being with her. But I knew if I came home, I would have been impossible. Home was 50 feet. You know, you know the commute was short. Um, and I would hit these tennis balls, and I will tell you, I would have tears, the tears of stress, just, you know, releasing it, running down my cheeks while I was playing. But I could go home and then be, you know, a good guy, be a good husband, be a good partner, be a good, you know, boss, be a good father, et cetera. And it was, it, so taking vacations, uh, coaching for my kids, you know, they're, they're only with you for so long, right? And, and, you know, I would walk away during the work day and the afternoon and coach. I would come back after and do what you have to do. Uh, eating well. I know that may seem crazy from a yogurt guy telling you, but, you know, crazy as it may seem, eat, you have to eat well. If you're, you know, anybody's worked on a political campaign, I can't understand how people ever win with all these, you know, under 25s eating nothing but pizza and drinking, you know, bad coffee and Coke. But that's, you know, that's not a, a road to success. This is these, starting one of these enterprises is a marathon, and you have to take care of yourself. And that leads me to the final uh, point, which is really the reason that we're here, which is you really cannot underestimate the critical power of having a mission, a social or environmental purpose to what you're doing. I, I can sit here and tell you right now, Stonyfield would not exist were it not for our commitment to organics, our family farmers, um, reducing our carbon footprint, which as it turns out was very profitable. Most of the things we did, building wastewater treatment plants that where we got the waste back and used it as energy, reducing the weight of cups. Um, you know, these things actually, I wrote a whole book about this, as Michael mentioned. These things actually generated, put money to our bottom line. But, but our, 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 you know, the woman in Florida example I gave you, I mean, she, she wasn't just buying our yogurt. You know, she was out accosting, you know, strangers at the supermarket aisle saying, you know, buy, eat this stuff, right? Um, and, uh, you know, by the way, I hired her on the spot. Did I tell you that? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't, but I, 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 I certainly gave her a lot of coupons. Um, but, but the point is that, um, you know, having a social mission, A, gets you up in the morning. Uh, it's something, it gives you that extra kick when other things are getting you down. And I hope you've discerned from this that there was plenty to get us down. And we were driven, for sure, to not lose our investors' money. But we were driven as much by this vision of, of a different kind of agriculture. And today it's 1,800 family farmers, average herd size 70 cows, who, are, who tell me all the time, we wouldn't be in business were it not for you. 
It's, it's uh, hundreds of thousands of chemical-free acres uh, as a result of this uh, mission. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is if you just, and I'll just speak about consumer products for a moment, but I think this translates to services or any other uh, business. If you stop and just think about sort of the history of commerce, the, the goal has always been, you know, make the product as cheap as you can you know, extract as much gross margin as you can and then use that to buy advertising to tell people how great your product is. You know, it's, 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 I mean, think of Coke and Pepsi, right? There's nothing cheaper than sugar, water, corn syrup, and carbon dioxide. You know, there's some carbon dioxide. It's pretty cheap. It's widely available, you know. Um, and so they take this very cheap, you know, bunch of stuff, and we all know, m m you know, cheap is not really cheap because we... We, will, we may not pay for it at the cash register, but we're paying for it with our health care or somewhere else or with the environment. But they take this very cheap product, charge a lot for it relative to the cost, and then use that money to, you know, buy Super Bowl ads or, you know, put machines up everywhere. Th that's a model that, frankly, not, you know, unless you've got deep pockets uh, behind you, most that's unavailable to most of us. And so... Stonyfield's model was the exact opposite. We actually believe family farmers should be paid more because that's the way you get higher quality. That's the way you, you get uh, the kind of, you pay for the labor that is needed to you know, create, to build topsoils, to do organic farming. And with, and with that investment in our product and in our supply chain, um, for sure, we didn't have money for advertising. But we found other ways to communicate, and it was what we were doing that became our marketing. Um, we put, in the early days, we had no money for advertising, of course, uh, but we had cows, so we put cows up for adoption. And you could send in five yogurt tops, and you would get a photograph of your cow, you would get a certificate naming you the co-owner of your cow, and then in those days, twice a year, your cow would send you letters, and the letters would talk about, you know, organic farming and how nice the farm was and how beautiful the soil was. And, you know, nowadays it's gone paperless. They tweet, they blog. The cows are very, you know, they're very adept, but they, you know, we don't mail stuff out. But the point is that gave us an opportunity. We had hundreds of thousands of people who adopted cows. Joan Rivers adopted a Stonyfield cow live on national television. Jay Leno adopted a cow on, t on national television. So, you know, the thing, is, the thing is, at the end of the day, what your play is here, and I'm, I'm being a little bit, uh, you know, um, mercenary in saying this, but, you know, you start with a mission. You start with something that you believe in. The, now what you have to do is, is persuade others to buy into it. Well, what you, what, the cheapest consumer you're going to get, customer you're going to get, is ne the next customer you're going to get is the one you've already got to get them to repeat buy. Right? That's the e and, and even better is to get them to talk like that woman in Florida. And that's called loyalty. Loyalty is an emotion. It, it arises from an inside place. It's, it comes from a place of trust, from feeling good, from feeling warm and fuzzy, whatever, you know, some positive feeling. And your mission is your competitive advantage because that's an ability to distinguish you from somebody who doesn't have a mission of giving back, of recycling, of... Of, of educating, as you'll hear from Sally in a moment, of, of really ad attacking obesity, which is you know, her, her motivation in, 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 in starting out with Chop Chop. So you know, the thing is, is that mission, social mission is about authenticity. It's something you really can't fake, and, and most of us can tell when it's not real. You know, there's a, there's a most of us, uh, you know, when you, when that bond of loyalty and trust is broken, you don't forgive the next time, right? So a company that might have a great philanthropic initiative but has, is you know, caught polluting or has a glass ceiling that prevents women from rising in management or whatever it is, is going to sooner or later you know, break that, that bond of trust, that bond of loyalty. And for us, um, you know, that was the currency that made us possible. And I, I, I'd love, you know, you to, I, I certainly, you know, hope that you think that we make the best yogurts on earth. I think we, you know, are right up there. But, but I can tell you that a lot of people made good yogurts in our day over the years. But it was having this added commitment
to family farmers and all that we've stood for taking chemicals out of the biosphere that allows me to be here talking to you, allows us to do the kinds of things we're doing. So it's eminently worth it, and it's a really good business strategy. Um, but if you do it just for the latter, it, you know, then you know, you're going to get found out. I mean, pick your cause, celebrate it, talk about it, be transparent, take care of yourself as you do it, watch your cash. Um, don't ask, don't get. These are the ingredients. But the mission, you know, as an umbrella for me, I look back and think, you know, that, that, without that, no, uh, absolutely no stony field. So thanks for listening to our story. Gary, thanks so much for sharing those great lessons of learned over 30 years of really building Stonyfield into one of our country's most prominent social ventures. And I'm hoping that Gary's lessons have really inspired a lot of you in the room that uh, anything is possible. Um, we have a couple of minutes for questions for Gary, and then we'll bring up our, our second speaker for tonight. So any questions for Gary? Sure. Yeah, way in the back. Oh, thank you. Where's my coupons when I need them? So. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to say, I, I saw something, I think it was on PBS a while back, about um, the Stonyfield Foundation and how they're trying to raise money for Stonyfield. And I think that's a really good example of how you can build a Yeah, yeah, not just uh, not intuitive, but there's a couple seats right up front here if you want, feel free. Uh, but also it was very unpopular, especially with my uh, clientele, right? You know, my, uh, the organic consumer is, um, uh, you know, by and large, d distrusts large corporations, uh, doesn't like Walmart for what it's done to downtowns or whatever the issue may be, and certainly Walmart is not what you would call an organic paradise, walking up and down the aisles. Um, on the other hand, they are the biggest buyer of organic produce on the planet. Um, uh, car organic carrots make up 22% um, of their carrots, uh, for example. It's double digits. Um, but uh, yeah, we made the choice to go with them because of this belief that um, you know, this isn't just a, a little fad here, this organic thing. This is about eliminating chemicals from the biosphere, harmful chemicals. And until we get to scale, you know, pe people say organic isn't really proven, but I, I would say it's the chemicals that are not really proven. We've been on a 70-year experiment with our bodies and the planet. And, and don't take my word for it, the president's cancer panel, the high, most prestigious oncologic panel on Earth, um, has said that 41% of Americans now are going to be di alive today are going to be diagnosed with cancers in our lifetimes. That's one in two men, one in three women. Uh, and they implicate uh, in inadvertent exposure to chemicals in everyday life as the cause. This is oncologists, not environmentalists talking. And so for us, uh, and when you look at uh, some of the really dangerous practices with herbicides now, especially related to genetically engineered foods, which are herbicide tolerant, which I'm most of my time now is spent working on a national campaign to uh, label GE foods. Um, you know, it's pretty serious work. We can't afford to be, I mean, the good news with organics is we're $35 billion sector. Uh, now we've grown enormously from the days of the seven cows back in the early going. Uh, but the bad news is we're 4.3% of US food. While, while you have occasional you know, double digit wins like carrots at Walmart, it's still we're pretty small. We've got to get back to 40, 50, 60, 70, or 100%. And the UN shows that organic can feed the world. So for me, uh, the, the, the mission trumped the uh, reputational concerns that I had. Because I knew that until we're not, we haven't arrived till we're on the shelves of Walmart. And also, I knew that organic, you know, there's a thousand reasons to eat organic food, but there's one very good reason not to. It's very expensive. And for most people, unlimited means, Walmart is the only place that people can shop at. So I, organic was never intending to be food for the elite. It's supposed to be for everybody. And, you know, we'll get there, uh, but we'll get there by going into places like that. And, you know, we had boycott threats and all kinds of, you know, people upset, but I, 
I, I very proudly, you know, said then and, and say today that, you know, we want to be not just in the Whole Foods and the farmers markets and the CSAs and the co-ops. We want to be in all those places. We want to be wherever food is sold. That's food deserts, convenience stores, Walmarts, airports. You know, I just came through an airport today. I mean, you know, you can't find anything to eat there, right? There's almonds and oatmeal at airports. You, you can find those too. But uh, so, so for us, it was because it was central to our reason to be that it, it was a no-brainer. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So you spoke a lot about the struggles that you faced early on in the company. And now, um, years later, it's obvious that Sony Gill is in a good position with Danone, and you're here to stay. So what would you say is the biggest, some of the biggest challenges that are now facing your company? So ironically, uh, well, there's, 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 th there's three. But ironically, the biggest is supply. We have a very hard time um, keeping up with demand. There's, um, you know, ultimately, you know, we, we would love all of our dairy to be 100% grass fed. But here in New England, we have this little problem called winter, you know, which kind of gets in the way, although climate change may solve that, I guess. But uh, that was a bad joke. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, the same feed that we need to, for organic feed, so too does Pete and Jerry's. Uh, Applegate, the organic meat company, I mean, Annie's, you know, the cereal companies. So we're all competing for a supply that is um, not just limited, but because it's limited, it's, it's expensive. And so our margin, our, our price gap versus, you know, we, we were the first domestically produced Greek yogurt in America. Nobody can remember that because it's now 50%. <coughs> and we made a little mistake in picking the place that we went to make it. We went to make it in the factory that is became Chobani, and they kicked us out, but that's a different story. But the point is, is that um, all the rest of the Greek yogurts came in cheaper than us, selling 10 for 10 bucks. And you know we can't do that and, and still pay our farmers. So, so uh, availability and cost of supply, big challenges. Now, the entrepreneurs in the room should take this this way. Big opportunity. Organic feed, organic grain. My, my nephew runs Peak Organic, the organic beer company. That's his company. Organic hops. I mean, organic supply chain. This is why we, Stonyfield and a bunch of other companies funded the organic farm here at the university to get the extension service working on behalf of organic to find out that you really do get healthier cows. Organic cows live twice as long as conventional cows. So supply chain is huge. Um, the uh, threat of uh, GMOs is a very big challenge for us uh, because most genetically engineered crops, though they talk about feeding the world, the five or six chemical companies that actually um, you know, are the patent holders of these crops have really engineered them to sell more chemicals. They're, they're most 96% of GMOs are for herbicide tolerance, which means we've built ourselves an herbicide uh, treadmill out there. We, 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 we put crops out there that that you can use more herbicides. We build resistant herb, uh, resistant weeds. We use even stronger herbicides. Get even you know weeds dependent on them, and it's just this one-way street that makes them very profitable. So when we had the fight in New Hampshire last year, which we'll have again this year, and you saw full-page ads being taken out, you know that wasn't charitable giving. That was these companies defending their profits, and they make huge money on their seeds and their chemicals. But for us, it's a threat because. We're, we're with with uh, the amount of herbicides that are out there. You know, herbicide drift threatens organic farmers, so that's the second uh, big one. And then the third one, to be really honest and, and can, uh, candid with you, is uh, consumer confusion. Um, yeah, we have um, uh, done a bad job as an industry, organic, uh, educating the consumer about exactly what organic is. Uh, we've actually um, here I'm contradicting what I said before about over communicating, but I would say do smart over communicating. Unfortunately, if you look at my literature over 30 years, you'll see well, organic is biodiversity, improving topsoil, helping family farmers, uh, avoiding antibiotics, uh, stopping synthetic growth hormone. You know, I mean, the average person cannot take all that in. It's really about avoidance of chemicals. And, and now we're starting. Uh, the, uh, the coalition that I lead is now getting the whole industry pulled together around that message. Yes, we do all these other wonderful things, but you know, part of having a mission is the elevator pitch, right? Being able to 
you know, say it. And our elevator, the elevator pitch on organic is, you know, no toxic pesticides. And, and, and you know, right now, 60 to 100 percent of rainwater samples in the Midwest contain herbicides in the rain. People are breathing them. So we have grown a wonderful industry, but we need to be united around that message and, 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 and stop consumers from being uh, confused about it.